Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. No, this is not Alan Shartok. Hi, I'm David Gustina, producer of the program and host of WAMC's Morning Edition on WAMC. Alan will be back next week and return to his hosting duties. This week, however, we're joined by Dr. Lee Meringoff, a familiar voice on these airwaves, a member of the political science faculty at Marist College and director of the Marist Institute of Public Opinion, or the well-known Marist Poll. Lee, welcome back. Hey, my pleasure. Sorry, uh, Alan is not doing this, but I, I think we have a step up in class, if I must say so. Oh, my gosh. That is on the air. I don't know. I'll have to edit that out for crying out loud, Lee. No, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all these years together with Alan now, 27 years and, and still going wow. strong, and uh, yeah. we can finish each other's sentences. Sentences. So, uh, oh wow! Well, power to him, power yeah. to him, and power to you. Oh, well, Probably fun. more power to you. I'm thinking, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you, of course, have been partnering for national polls these days: NPR, yes. PBS NewsHour, Marist National Poll. Let's start with this: the overturning of Roe v. Wade. We know many states yeah. have acted here, including New York, in one way or the other. It has shaken up America. There are certainly dividing lines here, but the majority certainly opposing overturning Roe v. Wade. Can you break it down more for us, Lee? Sure. I mean, uh, as you indicate, this was a very dramatic uh, decision by the court, um, changing the direction of, of half a century, really, uh, of uh, policy and, and, and approaches to the court to this issue. issue uh, 56% oppose overturning Roe, um, and 57% thought that the decision was politically motivated, not based on the law. And I think that is something we might want to talk about. That's certainly important. Um, a lot of people have lost trust in the, in the Supreme Court. Only 39% say they have a great deal or quite a lot of trust in the court. Um, there was an interesting uh, sidebar in all this was that 62% of registered voters say the decision by the court makes them more likely to vote in the midterm elections. And that included 78% of Democrats, but only 54% of, of Republicans. And a majority of Democrats, a majority of Americans, I should say, are also concerned that the court's decision could also jeopardize the rights uh, to other issues like contraception, same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships. Um, so this was a decision that really, uh, you know, divided the nation uh, in a very political way. Um, I think it was uh, generally an unpopular decision, uh, probably not the last of those uh, when you're talking about a six to three uh, advantage uh, on the more conservative elements of the court. Um, and, uh, you know, looking ahead towards November, which is where people are looking uh, on almost everything these days, uh, you know, the idea that Democrats seem more motivated now to vote uh, and see this as a wake up call, um, among other things, uh, I think that becomes uh, even more important than, than uh, you know, just the decision, which is obviously the, the more significant part, but the, cl clearly the uh, voting and motivation for, for uh, the fall elections uh, you know, has its place as a, being a very important part of this. It seems like Democrats more than Republicans are activated now to go out and vote. I'm wondering, though, yeah. whether a salient issue like abortion trumps an issue like inflation. Well, see, this is what's interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, several of the issues that have been sort of occupying uh, the nation lately, uh, abortion, uh, guns, uh, the, the, the very status of our democracy and, and the hearings over uh, uh, over January 6th uh, attack on the Capitol. Um, these are all things that um, 
aren't one and done news stories. They are, uh, first of all, things that are going to continue and have, you know, have some shelf life of, of, of significance. Um, so I think that's one thing clearly that that's important. And the other thing I think, um, uh, like like inflation. Uh, these are issues, abortion and guns, uh, and the state of our democracy that people, you know, are influenced by. It impacts them. Um, that's also clearly true about inflation. Uh, but now uh, our minds are uh, occupied and focused on these other issues, which you know are, you know, very specific for people: uh, reproductive rights, uh, safety from guns. Um, the uh, what's going to happen with all these uh, potential court cases with the, the health of our democracy and, and the hearings. Um, they're long lasting and they do have uh, they do cut close to home. Um, and I think that you're going to see, uh, you know, the impact of this is not going to be, well, as I say, one and done. I think we're going to see it ongoing. And the inflation is an interesting one because you know, ultimately, as we know, the economy makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but do we really know what the mood about inflation is going to be in three, four months uh, when gas prices have started to dip? And uh, we just don't know where that issue is going to be going and whether it's going to be front and center or how much these other issues are going to dominate. And right now they're playing to the Democrats' advantage in terms of the enthusiasm um, and really, uh, you know, the questions are about enthusiasm, but what we're really tapping into is a, an anger people have, a, a rage that they feel uh, because the court decision, uh, the, the lack of movement on guns, um, these are all things that, uh, that are, seem to have really uh, riled up the Democratic base in ways that uh, Joe Biden certainly hasn't. Yeah, and it's expressing itself in a low confidence in the Supreme Court. I mean, Americans have not always had this interpretation of the court. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, you know, the court, of course, has sort of been supposed to be an impartial uh, kind of referee of the other branches. And, um, you know, now it has placed itself in a very activist role, um, which is uh, historically not as Act, I mean, right now it's more than than recent memory. Uh, obviously, the court has reshaped the direction of the country in voting rights and civil rights uh, over the decades um, and in other dramatic ways. Uh, but this is kind of a, an event here that uh, that really is, uh, as we we're talking about, is shaking you know close to home. And it also because it's viewed as political. Um, look, the, the, the selection process. There was a time not too long ago that uh, conservative uh, Justice Scalia won with almost unanimous support uh, in, uh, in days gone by. If the Senate felt that this was a good uh, j- jurisprudent decision, a good lawyer, a good judge, um, that the president had a right to pick his person uh, reflecting um, you know, the, the, the direction, uh, the legitimacy of that selection. Um, now it's, it's it's pure politics in the selection process, and we've seen that, uh, you know, in the uh, decision by Mitch McConnell when he was in the majority to um, to uh, not take up uh, a case that Obama had put forth. Uh, Merrick Garland. Judge Garland, yeah, and then of course turning right around uh, when Trump was in power to uh, to put uh, Amy Coney Bryant in. So, you know, the thing has very, become very politicized. You know, it takes right now, as everyone knows, 60 votes to uh, overturn a filibuster and to get closure on, 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 the, uh, on issues like Roe and, and other changes to codify it uh, in, in the Congress. But the Republicans who I've mentioned uh, selections by uh, Donald Trump and, and other Republican presidents, none of them had 60 votes uh, in, in the Senate. Um, so in a sense, they were put in, you know, usually with the low 50s, sometimes, it's, you know, 52, 48 kind of thing. And um, and yet it takes a super majority to uh, to undo the work that this mere majority is able to do. So it's something to think about in terms going forward. Uh, in our poll, people are not eager to expand the court. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a, an answer uh, that the public is comfortable with. Um, and I think it's 
uh, there's more comfort uh, on the part of voters in um, in passing laws that uh, that undo the direction that this court is taking. Uh, but right now, that, that that takes a big vote, and that takes 60 unless the Democrats pick up seats in the Senate this fall, uh, get past the uh, Senator Mansion and, and Senator Cinema a roadblock to changing the filibuster. So if they pick up a couple other seats, uh, but they still have to hold the House, and that might be a taller order right now for the uh, Democrat Party going ahead and fall. We are speaking with Dr. Lee Marengoff, the director of the Marist Institute of Public Opinion, the Marist Poll. Lee, maybe I missed this, and forgive me if I did, but in that low confidence in the Supreme, do you have a breakdown of whether there's any blame cast on either party for why it's become so politicized? Well, I think, you know, this is the times we live in, and that's reflected in these numbers. But when you have decisions right now, that the court is taking that go in the face of public opinion in a very significant way. Um, so in the case of, of reproductive rights and, and uh, other issues of, of different rights uh, that different groups uh, share, um, that's really the decisions of the court are out of line with public opinion. Recent decisions on uh, climate change um, also fly in the face of, of public opinion. So you have a court right now that is charting its own course um, in terms of being very activist um, and uh, moving ahead in ways uh, that you know go counter to a large majority of Americans uh, uh, driven by huge numbers among Democrats, but numbers among independents, and some numbers among uh, uh, of Republicans as well. When you look at issues like, uh, like uh, gun control issues, um, you know, people are uh, motivated again, and that's, that's a decision that clearly is in the, the area of Congress. So you end up with a Supreme Court that's moving in a different direction. A, uh, a reluctant Congress to reflect uh, the will of the public on, on critical issues uh, like gun control. Um, and then uh, President Biden, who is, hasn't got the votes in the Hill to overcome the filibuster. And so as much as he would like to uh, shake the bully pulpit, um, he's really not able to do that. Uh, so as a result, Public opinion is sort of out there on its own. The democracy, many feel, is under attack. Um, and when it comes to public policy, like the ones we're talking about, guns and reproductive rights, um, the court on the one hand and Congress on the other are really not fulfilling the majority, overwhelming majority of public opinion. It doesn't mean they need to. I mean, you know, you know we always, uh, you know, have that argument in our country about uh, you know how representative uh, decision makers should be of our of our um, of public opinion uh, but right now you have a huge gap a major disconnect that has uh, emerged on these fundamental issues and where public opinion is um, when you look at guns for example uh, people want stricter gun control they want background checks uh, they would not support uh, notions advanced by candidates of uh, teachers um, who would be then allowed to carry guns uh, in the classroom. Uh, they want a ban on uh, semi-automatic weapons. Um, they would vote against uh, candidates who get support from the NRA. Um, so down the line, people are saying they really want to protect, uh, uh, that they support controlling gun violence way over the protecting of gun rights, that the Second Amendment for most Americans doesn't cover uh, at all what we've been witnessing uh, daily in the country. Uh, but overall, uh, again, like on the question of reproductive rights, uh, when we ask about you know whether people are more likely to vote or less likely to vote, when we ask about recent gun violence uh, and the tragedies that we've been, you know, seeing and following. Uh, Democrats are 84 percent tell us they're more likely to vote this November, 65 percent of Republicans. The same pattern uh, emerges on guns as does on reproductive rights, one in the area of the Congress and the elections, the other in terms of the Supreme Court. Um, so in a sense, the public is a very similar place um, on both these issues. 
and uh, they're very unhappy. It's a very fearful, angry, uh, enraged electorate right now. And then the question becomes, what does that do for the midterm elections when traditionally the first midterm election of a president is a disaster for that president's political party? So the question becomes, can the Democrats um, kind of break with that tradition, uh, pick up a couple of seats in the Senate and hold the House? And, you know, the betting money is no, but my guess is you're probably well advised not to place the bet yet. Uh, I think this is still a very much a fluid situation. Um, and I think that the weakness of Joe Biden doesn't necessarily automatically convert into Democrats having short uh, support uh, in the fall elections. Um, I'll just add one other point on this is that uh, Donald Trump, for example, ran behind congressional Republicans uh, two years ago in 2020. Um, and right now we're seeing with the generic congressional ballot question, Democrats are in the high 40s, whereas Joe Biden is in the high 30s on his approval rating. So the Democratic congressional candidates, it looks like like in two years ago when uh, Trump, as I say, ran below uh, the congressional candidates, the Democratic congressional candidates, if they replicate that uh, for themselves, then, you know, I think we have to watch these midterm elections with a little more critical eye than we otherwise would have. Yeah. And as you pointed out earlier, Lee, if we see, for example, gas prices starting to come down as we head toward sure. the fall, there could be other factors. Stay tuned, as you point out, that could buck this trend of the midterms and maybe help the Democrats win a few seats. Yeah. Now, going against that, of course, are things like redistricting and the fact that there are fewer safe seats. I, I Sorry, fewer swing seats right. and, and more safe seats than, than there have been. Uh, so there's little, the, the, there's less up for grabs. Uh, and the Democrats, you know, clearly holding only a single digit uh, lead in the House, really can't afford much slippage at all. And uh, without flipping the House to the uh, Republicans, and then that creates a whole new dynamic. I mean, the Democrats are in a really miserable position right now because they control the White House and they control both houses, both chambers in Congress. But it's all very weak, and it's not a uh, a governing majority for them. So in a sense, the having a majority it works well for the Democrats, but it doesn't do much for governing. We're speaking with Dr. Lee Maringoff, director of the Marist Institute of Public Opinion, and you are listening to The Capital Connection. I'm David Gustina, filling in for Alan Shark Talk this week. Don't worry, he will be back next week. Well, Lee, we just talked about low opinion of the Supreme Court. We know that public opinion polls on Congress, even the presidency are low. And I know I read and Alan and I discussed recently, I believe it was a Gallup poll, on the loss of confidence generally in the institutions yeah. in our society. And we're talking about the police, yeah. uh, education, health care, all these various places where Americans are expressing they've lost confidence. They're cynical. They don't believe in these institutions. I mean, Lee, what does that say to you about a functioning democratic society? Society. Well, it, it, it's troublesome. You know, most people, the overwhelming majority, feel that the country's headed in the wrong direction, uh, and they don't have any comfortable place or place with confidence that they want to turn to that can provide that redirection that that, that they like. So clearly, Donald Trump didn't create this, but he certainly tapped into it and he expanded the distrust that people have in institutions across the board. I remember the questions that we used to ask and others like Gallup have asked in Pew Research on confidence. And as you say, doctors used to be high and clearly after COVID, that's not the case. And so the trust in the public health community was also put through the political grinder. The uh, other groups, education groups, that's become seen as more also so part of our political marketplace. And Lee, um, Lee, and, information. Yeah. Well, I forgot to say information. Don't forget journalism. I mean, since, oh, yes. since oh, Watergate, yes. well, we're was, now as actually, low as we go. <laughs> I was going to get there. That was the kicker line that uh, you, uh, your folks and that. my folks aren't exactly doing too well either. When it comes to the media and public opinion measures, um, this is also a doubt. So the bottom line in all this is there's no comfortable place to turn for the redirection. And so people say, well, 
you know, we elect people, we have hope, and that seems to be dashed because the country is so divided right now. We have not had a, a solid governing coalition that reaches across party lines for quite some time. And when it comes to important bills and critical issues, you know, Congress is really in the battle of outstake. And then you look to where the leadership would come from, and then you don't really know where to turn. And that's why when the Supreme Court takes the proverbial blow by the horns here and moves public policy in such a dramatic fashion, counter to public opinions and the desires of people by this overwhelming majority, and the fear that that is only here to stay with a 6-3 majority, that really is for a lot of people a, a source of concern, to put it mildly. Um, and there's more cases coming up in the next session, which would impact on democracy, which uh, have to do with the role of state legislatures in determining electoral college votes. And I think that's something we're going to be hearing a lot more about. And the question is whether Congress can get its act together and change, do some electoral college reform to head that off or else the 2020 election is going to look tame compared to the 2024 presidential election. There's a danger lurks around the corner. Uh, and I think that the um, the hearings uh, in Congress, I think they've been doing an excellent job. But, you know, it's going to have limited impact because a large part of the country isn't on board. Let's change gears for a minute. The Marion Goff mm-hmm. from the Marist Poll. Let's talk about Title IX. Now, we just sure. celebrated the 50th anniversary on June 23rd this year. It's the groundbreaking legislation which banned discrimination based on sex in the United States. You have yeah. done a poll yeah. on this, and it, I'm wondering what people are saying about Title IX. So, yeah, we, we did this uh, poll. It is the 50th anniversary. People feel that significant progress has been made. What was interesting is a lot of the original thinking behind Title IX did not necessarily have to do with gender equality. It had to do with lots of other rights as well. But when we look at some of the accomplishments of that, people see that in terms of the women's place in a lot of career paths is so much different than it was. And not not to go back in time again, but when I was in college, women couldn't get credit cards without the consent of their husbands or fathers in that instance. So in a sense, there have been lots of things in the education world in the world of medicine, in the world of sports, that have all changed dramatically since the institution of Title IX 50 years ago uh, during the Nixon administration, interestingly enough. But now we look at some of these issues that we're talking about today, and we see that reproductive rights are being challenged, other rights are being challenged, and there's a lot of concern about fundamental things which Title IX assured, worked towards, and in many ways accomplished. And now the question is, are we turning back the hands on the clock? Are we going back to an an earlier era where, in a sense, the path to Title IX has to be revisited and rejuvenated going forward? You know, uh, right now, there's Brittany Griner, the uh, female basketball star, being detained, mild word, in Russia. And she just wrote a lengthy letter to President Biden because she's concerned she's not getting out anytime soon. And, you know, so there's there's a sense here, well, if this were LeBron James, would the nation be up in arms? And the answer is yes. So the question is, the gap in this specific case, you know, illuminates that this is not a done deal, that we haven't by any means created the equality that Title IX strove for, but we did make progress, and that needs to be noted. You know, you can make differences, and you can change the lives of people. Yeah, and I'll just finally note, let's not forget that Megan Rapino and women's soccer achieved equal pay. Yes, that was really very interesting and quite illuminating, and I think we are going to see societal and and cultural advances along those lines. The legal channels, though, seem to be cluttered right now and uh, gets back to, With you know, conservative where's judges. the leadership? <laughs> yeah, where's the leadership going to come from and what branch of the government is going to provide that energy that, that's needed to reignite some of these changes that people want? I mean, it's not like the public has to be convinced on some of these things. The public is already there. It's the leader sworn. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you a final question. This is one I thought about for a while and wonder what you think. You've said it a couple of times, and between you and Alan, you add up all those years, you know more than most of the people who were born after 1960 combined. What what have you noticed about public opinion, Lee, over your long career? Are Americans, for example, more likely to embrace conspiracy theories like the big line? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Although, keep in mind that in 1963, after the assassination of President Kennedy, sure. there were lots of conspiracy theories. But right now, they're embraced by a wider swath of the nation to the point that facts have become alternative facts, dare I say, as we learned from Kellyanne Conway during the Trump years. Right. So, yeah, but I will put in a very positive note. The younger generation seems to be much more connected with issues of tolerance and progress and desire to uh, move things forward. One of the problems Joe Biden's having right now is younger people don't think he's liberal enough and pushing that agenda enough. So in a sense, young people are, as often as the case, are looking to move things in a different direction than the generation that's moving on. Do you think and they'll that, vote, Lee? Will those young people well, vote in better numbers than they do now? Yeah, well, that would be really interesting. I, I have to think yes, because these issues are so significant, so serious. You know, the pandemic was kind of a wake up call that things can become very serious very quickly. You know, in our system, when there's an action, there tends to be a reaction. And so everything we've been talking about has things that have moved in one direction. Now things are moving in a different direction. And that's the way our system tends to rebalance itself. Right now, the agenda is higher, but it's going to take the involvement of younger people to help that find its equilibrium again. Because, we, you know, people who follow things know that that's really very needed right now. We have big problems. And it's only going to change with the participation of, of people. And the big change would be people of color and young people to step up more and just have their voices felt because they already are there in terms of attitudes. Well, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. Our guest has been Dr. Lee Maringoff. He is the director of the Barrist Institute of Public Opinion, the well-known Marist Poll. Lee, I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to sit with Alan today. It's been my honor to talk to you. And of <laughs> course, we'll have you back again and talk more numbers. And best wishes to Alan. He will be back, as you say, very soon. And, you know, I'll be happy to trade jabs with him down the road. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure he won't mind that at all. Thanks, Lee. Okay, take care. 